Hey guys, thanks for checking out another podcast. I have a fascinating conversation today with Guy Hamilton Smith. He's an attorney and a scholar who studies sex related offenses here in the United States. Uh, he talks about his own experiences as a child victim and later in life as an offender himself. He goes on to talk about the origins of the Me Too movement, uh, how the United States manages sex related offenses, and how the style of management creates obstacles to achieving justice for victims and to um, reintegrate, reintegrating offenders into, into society. And we close out the conversation by talking about how we can move forward as a society and achieve better results, hopefully. So uh, sit back and enjoy the conversation. If you find this um, these podcasts useful, please remember the, the best way to support the show is by subscribing um, whatever platform you're on, leaving a review. And I'm also really happy to announce I have my own website now that has all of the uh, episodes, a bunch of other content, videos, live streams, and some articles. So check that out. It's www.thomasowenbaker.com. And I really appreciate all the support. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking another podcast. Um, before we get started, just I, I gave a brief intro, but just so everyone sort of knows a little bit about you, can you maybe start by telling us where you, where you grew up? Yeah, sure. Uh, I actually grew up in central Kentucky in uh, Lexington, which um, my parents had previously moved around a lot. My father worked for the... Um, you know, was a geologist and worked for the oil and gas industry, and was actually born in uh, England, which is, you know, one of my <laughs> many claims to fame. Is that well, I actually have like three citizenships, but um, I grew up in uh, in Kentucky in horse country, uh, which is also where I went to college and uh, also where I went to law school and where I wound up working for uh, several years in um, criminal defense uh, and doing also death penalty work and um, various other various other sundry things. Okay. And, and you said your, your dad was a, ge a geologist, worked in the natural gas industry? or Yeah, he, he, worked, he worked for... Uh, we, we ended up moving to Kentucky when I was like about eight years old. Um, and we moved here because my dad took a job with the Kentucky Geological Survey, which was attached to... The University of Kentucky, um, and uh, he did that for a while, and then he did some con consulting work, and then eventually the you know bottom kind of fell out of the oil and gas um, industry, and he went into um, he started teaching high school. He taught high school science, and he did that for I think about ten or eleven years, um, and before he retired, so he's retired now. Um, and my and my mother still, you know, she's just an absolute workhorse. You know, she's uh, still working um, in a neurologist's office. Okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. where where are your parents from? Are they? Are, you said you were born in England. Are they British or? Well, my it's. I mean, it's <laughs> my. Well, my mother. The the simple answer to that question is uh, my mom was born in New York. Uh, and my dad was born in uh, uh, Iran, uh, actually. Um, but been raised in Canada, uh, okay. and um, so he's he's got uh, and his parents were very were pro were proper British, um, and uh, that's what how I wound up being well born. My father was working for British Petroleum at the time, and that's how I wound up being born in London. So is the third citizenship Canadian? Do you have Canadian citizenship as well? Okay. Yeah, I have Canadian citizenship. Any, um, any, yeah. any thoughts of heading up there? Uh, <laughs> I've, yeah, I've, had, I've definitely given it some thought, especially lately with um, uh, how we seem to be handling or not handling the, uh, you know, the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I have my citizenship and um, my passport and I've got my uh, social insurance number. So I guess all I need to do is really just, you know, pack my bags and go if I want to go. But Okay. I haven't done it yet. I'm still, okay. still hanging in here. I've got the I've got the same. I've got Canadian citizenship as well. My wife and, uh, is Canadian, and it sounds crazy, but just seeing the way. So, like my my working class friends in Canada and my working class friends in the United States, seeing the discrepancy and how they've like how they've experienced the pandemic in terms of job loss and uh, payments. Like my Canadian friends, they've been sort of taken care of by the government there's a safety net in place there's a medical yeah. care there's problems but um just like here it just feels like every man for himself kind of a thing yeah here it's a very i think a very different we've had a very different response um than canada 
because yeah, like you said, my understanding is people are more or less, th things are more or less functional there uh, and people are more or less pulling together and they're handling things and people are being taken care of. And whereas here, like you said, um, I mean, the, our, our sort of social infrastructure is, um, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, the fault lines are really, are really apparent. Um, you know, and I mean, I'm certainly, I'm very fortunate in that my working situation hasn't really changed much. Um, but I know that's obviously not the case for many, you know, many people. Yeah. I watch being, Sort of, so I, I married my wife, got a PhD, and works at a university. And so I now I feel like I'm sort of a member of this professional managerial class where a, a lot of these people that I know are able to stay home, they're able to work from a home office, their checks haven't there haven't been impacted. Um, I really so I and then I have my uh, uh, people, a lot of people I grew up with who have had the exact opposite experience. So you see, it's not just it's not just like borders, but it's also a matter of class. Like the, your class, mm -hmm. you're gonna you've experienced this in com, in a completely different sort of sort of way. And I think yeah. this this sort of there's some underlying things about like the United States is an exceptional nation in many respects. And some of those are not good. <laughs> like, uh, uh, this, uh, America, this idea of American exceptionalism itself. Um, today we're going to talk about the carceral state that we've developed here, like it, and how it compares to the rest of the rest of the world and this like individuality and culpability. So I don't think they're completely sort of separate things. Um, I, what what brought what drew you? So today we're going to talk about uh, the Me Too movement and the carceral state. What what drew you to your your area of research? So you studied studied law. What mm. what uh, what drew you to this line of research? Yeah, I mean it's kind of a it's an interesting I mean it's an interesting and complicated story in terms of how it is that I came to sort of work um, at the intersection of criminal justice and sexual violence. I mean I went to law school. After my own experience with the uh, with the criminal legal system, and I wanted to be a public defender, um, and I didn't actually want to do <laughs> any sort of work when it came to um, you know sex offense registry, sexual violence, um, accountability, any of that. I just really wanted to put my head down and just do um, criminal defense work. Um, and uh, but that you know wasn't you know didn't wind up being um, sort of the the plan or that didn't wind up being what actually you know that that wasn't the plan but that wound up being what what happened um, and so what what um, sort of pulled me to this work uh, I mean I guess I you know I you know it's really all about um, sort of my history and my personal story. Um, and which starts when I was very young. I was um, the victim of sexual violence. I was raped when I was eight years old, shortly after. Um, actually, my parents and I moved here to, to Kentucky. Um, and that sort of introduced me to this, I, you know, the notion of sexuality and then also sexual violence. Um, and, you know, thereafter, um, I had some... Uh, I developed some, you know, um, mental health issues uh, in my, especially in my teens, and I developed um, some really unhealthy coping mechanisms, um, including uh, what I came to call, a, you know, an addiction or a compulsion when it comes to internet pornography, and that really developed um, through my teenage years, and I essentially downloaded everything I came across. Um, and one day I came across images that were not legal, um, and I, I knew, you know, what they were, uh, and I was, at first I was really sort of freaked out by them. Um, I was probably about 16 years old at the time, uh, but I was too, um, you know, I was too afraid to sort of ask anyone for uh, help. You know, I didn't really know who I could talk to, um, and so I just kept it, a, you know, a secret, and on the outside, you know, I lived a pretty regular life. Like I had a girlfriend and I was uh, in school. I was actually in graduate school at the time for clinical psychology. Like law was not um, on my radar at all. Uh, and um, how that all um, changed was my girlfriend back in 2006 um, found an, uh, an email on my computer from 
a woman that I'd been having uh, an affair with. And um, then she went looking through my computer to see what I was lying about. And she found this huge collection of pornography. Um, and a lot of it was totally, I guess, what you call normal or you know, certainly legal. Um, and some of it wasn't. And uh, she went to the police. And that day I was arrested. And, um, you know, it's strange. Like, I remember, so... Um, in the interrogation room, of course, you know, having worked in criminal defense um, after this whole, you know, experience, what criminal defense attorneys always tell you is, you know, don't ever talk to the police. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, I, I did. You know, I remember hearing my hearing them read me my Miranda warning, the, you know, you have the right to remain silent. Um, and I just I was able to get honest, you know, with them for the first time in my life. And what I remember is feeling um you know, feeling free uh, for the first time in, in a long time. Like I had this horrible secret that I couldn't tell anyone about. And I finally did. And, um, you know, for me, like it, my experience with the legal system, like going through it, um, you know, and these were images like I had um, downloaded to my computer. Like I didn't, um, you know, uh, I didn't, I was charged with two counts of possession um, of child pornography. And, uh, and, you know, and I was, and I was guilty. Um, it would be really easy, I think, for me to say that I didn't know that, you know, those images were there and, uh, you know, or someone planted them. But, you know, I mean, none of that would be true. So, mm -hmm. um, and my experience going through the legal system, like, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of support. I had family, friends. Um, I had parents who hired an attorney for me. And um, so... Uh, I was able to, I avoided, I didn't have to go to prison. Um, the judge gave me a, um, you know, a probated sentence, a, a suspended sentence where I could, um, you know, go to, go to school, go to work, um, you know, stay home, but um, serve my sentence in the community. But also a requirement, you know, just under the law was if, you know, you commit this crime, uh, if you commit any number of these, um, you know, any, any number of these listed crimes, then you have to go on the sex offense registry. You have to register right, as a sex right. offender for a prescribed period of time. And, can, and that varies state by state. It varies, you know, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And for my crime and for my, um, and for Kentucky, what it amounted, amounts to is a 25-year requirement. So, um, you know, I'm 36 now. Uh, I was 22 when I was arrested. And I'll be 49, I think, when I'm, you know, um, off off the registry. Mm -hmm. But I haven't been under criminal supervision for um, 10 years. But um, so, like I said, but that wasn't like I didn't go to law school because I wanted to work on sexual violence. Right. Um, right. Issue. Uh, in fact, I wanted to like stay away from from anything having to do with this. But it was a combination of things that eventually drew me to it. Um, you know, it was a chance encounter, and I've I've written a lot of sort of about my how I came to you know do this work. Uh, it was a chance encounter with a, um, a mother of a young man who had a very similar story to mine, except he died by suicide when he was awaiting um, you know awaiting uh, sentencing or um, going through the criminal the legal process. Um, he died by suicide, and so I I became acquainted with his family. Um, I also, you know, um, won a federal civil rights lawsuit um, in Kentucky, sort of banning that had banned. Kentucky had a law that essentially banned anyone uh, with a past uh, sex offense conviction from using social media. And, um, you know, I won that and I got on social media. I started writing about um, these issues, started writing about my story. That led to, um, you know, starting to write, I guess you'd call it freelance journalism, um, mm -hmm. you know, talking about, you know, what makes for good policy when it comes to preventing, um, holding, want, holding people accountable for harm that they've caused, which I think is important. Um, I think it's also important not just for people who have experienced um, sexual harm, but I think it's my experience is it's also important for um, people who have caused harm to be able to um, take accountability for that. Uh -huh. uh, and so 
you know, the, the work that I do now is sort of in, you know, talking about what are the policies that incentivize um, both accountability and prevention. Um, and our general, you know, sort of our general approach, which I have done a lot of uh, writing about, is that we have this idea of the recidivistic, you know, of offender, like someone who's just going to go out there and commit crime after crime after crime after crime. Um, and we have this whole infrastructure that we set up around this idea of um, recidivistic sexual violence, that we just need to contain these people somehow and we banish them from neighborhoods we um say don't rent to these people don't give them jobs don't give them housing etc cetera, etc cetera. and we just think if we just push them you know far enough off into some corner of you know uh, society that they'll just disappear and they won't right. you know, and then that's how we're going to solve the problem of sexual violence but the problem is that that does not track at all with the reality of um, you know, sexual violence, which I think uh, movements like Me Too have done a really, you know, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of critical things that you can say about Me Too. Um, but I think one of the one of the strengths is demonstrating that like that model of sexual violence is really not reality. I mean, it doesn't track with what we know. Because right, we right now we think of like the sort of if you watch television shows, if you you know listen to sort of the the, disc, the 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 popular discourse in society, it's it's that this is a type of offense that is different. It's an irredeemable, mm -hmm. like the scar the scarlet letter of the twenty first century American yeah. judicial system, where once you cross that line, you you can't come back. And we put we put these uh, this we put this infrastructure into place to make it so that you can't escape that. And now with the internet, mm -hmm. it's like. It, it's you know it's it, it's completely inescapable and you're saying that you're more you're arguing for like a restorative sort of approach is that fair to say i mean i think that um yeah i mean i i think that if like my you know like so i like have multiple identities when it comes to this topic right um like i'm someone who has um caused or at least contributed to the harm that others have experienced. Um, and I'm also someone who's experienced harm myself. Uh, and then I'm also like got this whole background in law and, you know, um, you know, if you want to call me an expert or, you know, or what have you. So I like, it's a synthesis of all these different identities to try, like, I, I, I want to try to advocate for policy that helps people heal like my experience with the legal system was one where like i could see where the legal system could be something where like all sort of parties to a crime are brought together and um and, and everyone is like left better for the experience um i don't think that's the system that we have uh, no. <laughs> i think that it's a system that essentially produces bad outcomes for everybody involved um and I think that's like I think that's a real tragedy, um, because I think back to my own experience of rape, and um, like for a long time I was very angry with uh, with this person, um, and yeah, and I think I did want um, you know I wanted the same pain that was inflicted on me to be inflicted on them, and like I, I understand that um, that impulse. You know, but it wasn't until sort of much later, like I realized that, um, you know, his he was an older boy and his father had most likely done the same thing to him that he was then doing to me. Like he was also someone who had been harmed. Um, and I think about like, you know, uh, would it does it do me any favors or does it help me to heal um, to know that like he can't ever have a family? or have a job or have a place to live. Like no matter if he changes or doesn't change, if he wants to make amends or doesn't want to make amends, like regardless, like all that's just fixed and static for him. And like inflicting that pain on him, like it doesn't help me to heal. You know, it doesn't help me to, me to um, reckon with the harm that was caused to me. Uh, and I think that, you know, you find that experience with a lot of people um, who go through the 
legal system as, and also why a lot of people simply don't report at all mm -hmm. uh, into this legal system because it's like the only option on the table is, well, the only thing we're going to do for you is we're going to punish this person. We're going to hurt them. Um, and it's like we have this whole conception of justice uh, that requires that people be made to suffer in equal measure, as opposed to like everyone sort of being made um, whole. Like I think if you talk about like this idea of restorative justice and what accountability looks like, you know, I think for me and for a, lo a lot of other people, accountability looks like, you know, what I experienced in that interrogation room where I was able to get honest. You know, I was able to say, I, I did this, you know. Um, and, and that's not to say there aren't going to be consequences for that. Um, but I think that, you know, we want to be able to incentivize people to take ownership of harm that they've caused. Um, and I think that what you know, what my experience has been, and I think what you'll, you know, uh, many other survivors would say is that that's really kind of what, you know, what people want is they want that accountability and they want that, you know, uh, commitment to change. Um, and the current, our current practice, you know, with this, with the adversarial system that we have and the criminal trial and that whole process, um, I think it disincentivizes that in a number of in a number of ways, um, which I've, you know, of course, written about. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that, and there are some, um, you know, I'd love to give a shout out to um, uh, Dr. Alyssa Ackerman um, and Alexa uh, Sardina, uh, I'm blanking on her last name, but they're really pioneering, and they also have a podcast um, that is, um, I think it's called Beyond Fear, but they're, they okay, are, I've seen, I've and, seen, yeah, I've seen that. I'll put a link in the description. Yeah, and they have, they're really pioneering this idea of restorative justice for in the, and they're, um, you know, and they're both um, professors and, and experts in their own right, and also survivors themselves, and um, they're really pioneering this work of, um, you know, restorative, restorative practices for um, sexual violence. Um, do, so, yeah, you, I mean, I think that the idea is just that the, the policies that we have, like, don't really um, help the people who are directly involved, um, you know, really in any way. I, so I hear you talk about your experience, what drew you to this field of study, and then I hear you speak about these other scholars. The, they're, they're notable to you. Do you feel as though for certain for certain topics that lived ex bringing lived experience into the research um, is, I don't want to say a necessity, but that it, it gives you a perspective that you couldn't have otherwise. And do you, do you feel as though that this is something that, that uh, is that we do enough of in the social sciences to, to bring people in who've had these, have who've had the actual lived experience to, or do you feel as though that can be a problematic or an obstacle for a scholar? I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, I think it, it can certainly be problematic and an obstacle, but I mean, I think it does, like, you do get a perspective um, having, you know, like my, my perspective having had my experiences is certainly one that I would say is you know, probably unique. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I am, um, you know, a big believer in education. Like I was very fortunate to be able to continue my education, to go to law school after, you know, this criminal conviction, you know, where the only difference between, you know, me and someone who served 10 years in federal prison is I just got lucky. Like that's it. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that having people who have gone, who've been justice involved and like bringing them into academia and like bringing them into these um, spaces where we can talk about, you know, what makes for effective policy, like having that perspective, I think is important and is one that um, academia, you know, and, you know, all spheres have really sort of shied away from um, having. And I think that's a real, um, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I think that's a real tragedy because, I mean, I think that those students and those perspectives um, are necessary to, if we want to talk about the punishment problem that we have in America, I mean, I think that you need to have people who have a perspective on that that isn't just one of, um, you know, um, someone who hasn't experienced it or someone who's only experienced it as, 
um, you know, sort of a passive observer. So, I mean, I do think that that perspective is helpful. And, and I think that also when it comes to sexual violence, like I have, you know, my sense is that I think that sexual harm and sexual violence is something that's impacted most people's lives in one way or another. Either they are themselves, they have themselves, um, you know, been survivors of sexual violence or they themselves caused someone else harm, even inadvertently, even, you know, without knowing it. And mm -hmm. so I think that's one reason why this is such a difficult topic to talk about, because there is a lot of pain here. You know, there's a lot of emotion. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. And I think like you, you say, like people may not even realize or things have, uh, like people perceive things differently. Sometimes there's like, it's not this stark line of good people, bad people. There's this long gradation of human behavior and yeah. over time it's interpreted differently. It's a very complex issue mm -hmm. today. We're going to talk so that the, we're going to talk about uh, a piece that you wrote. I'm going to put a link uh, in the description so people can uh, check it out. Um, it's called the agony and the ecstasy of me too, the hidden costs of reliance on the car on carceral uh, politics. So, mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking about Me Too. Can you maybe just start off? So I think everyone's heard the, the term, you know, like they know sort of basically what it means. Can you talk, yeah. maybe just give us just to ground this. Can you tell us a little bit about where the, where, where it originated from, what the original intention was, yeah. a little bit of the history of the movement? Yeah, I mean, I can, um, you know, just as a just general sort of overview, but it, Me Too is a term that was really coined by, in 2007, um, activist Tarana Burke, who was a camp counselor, um, I believe, and she was um, uh, a girl, a, a young girl in her care had disclosed to her an instance of, um, you know, sexual molestation at the hands of, I think it was um, her stepfather, or something like that. But um, that experience, like, left with, um, you know, Toronto Burke, this, this, you know, she wanted to connect with this girl. And, like, what the words that came to her mind were me, too. Like, you know, that I, you know, I'm also a survivor of, you know, you're not alone. And that's, um, you know, was kind of the original, um, or at least one of the, the original sort of motivations of, um, the idea behind Me Too was to center the experiences of survivors and uh, let them know that they're not alone, that they don't have to be um, ashamed and to help them heal from trauma, um, which, I mean, is, of course, how you, how anyone heals from trauma is you heal from trauma in, in community. Um, and so that was, you know, she did that work for, you know, many, many years um, as a community activist. Um, and then, you know, it wasn't until, you know, uh, many years later, was it 2017, um, that Alyssa Milano, I'll have to like check the paper for the exact date, but Alyssa Milano, um, you know, tweeted it and it sort of became a, I mean, a hashtag. I mean, that's when it sort of, um, was elevated into the national consciousness as this referendum on sexual violence in America. Um, and that, um, you know, that empowered survivors to raise their voice and to be able to say this happened, you know, this happened to me. I am also a survivor of sexual, um, sexual violence. Um, and so that's kind of the, um, the general background for, um, the, just in a very view from 10,000 feet. I mean, it can get, uh, insanely complex, complicated. Um, right. Cause, cause it, it's, it's found its way into like, almost, it seems like every sort of facet of American life in the workplace in the family mm -hmm. in the judicial system, uh, pol politics, pretty much uh, the, the media, you know, it, it's everywhere and it's sort of taken, it takes on its own life as it moves through these organizations. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's become something of a, you know, sort of like a Rorschach test, uh, like a cultural Rorschach test. Like people see in it the things that, um, you know, the things that they want to see. But I mean, I think that there's also many different variations of it, like many different approaches to how we want to try to reckon with um, sexual harm in America. I mean, I think it's still very much an unsettled and unanswered um, question. And maybe it's just one that culturally we're still trying to wrestle with and figure out like how um how to reckon with it um and you know who knows like who knows where we go from here um but yeah i think it's still very much a you know a live uh issue i mean we still don't have um I, you know i mean i think that you look at 
well, even like what happened with, and I mean, I have a pretty complicated take on Brett Kavanaugh, but I mean, I think that you look at what happened with his confirmation hearing um, and what happened with Dr. Ford. Uh, and I, I think that it's pretty evident that we still don't have a handle on how to talk about um, <laughs> you know, these issues in, in our culture. So we're still, we're still trying to work it out. Well, you say we're still trying to work it out, but it, it also sounds in the paper like that there is there is a there is some consensus, not only consensus, but there's there's a, a, the word you use. You say there's a, a uniquely American equality that uh, mm -hmm. that everyone should be treat, treated equally harsh. So yeah. we in our society we sort of we have a reliance on if if if, if something isn't right, well that means that we need to take a harder lot. Can you, can you unpack that? Let me talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah. There's a really great article that really influenced my thinking a lot on this. Um, it's called two cultures of punishment by Joshua Kleinfeld, who's a law professor, um, I believe at Northwestern. Uh, and it really, um, so yeah, this idea that we need to treat everyone equal, e you know, equally like, and we're going to treat everyone equally harshly is this notion that like, we can either level up or level down punishment, right? So, uh, you know, you see like news stories about, well, this person committed this crime and he only got uh, mm -hmm. six months in jail versus um, other people get, you know, all this extra time. And like, so our, you know, that'll inflame our sense of inequality, particularly when like things like race enter into it, mm -hmm. where you have a white defendant who receives a lenient sentence versus, um, or at least a perceived lenient sentence, versus a defendant of color who received a much harsher sentence. Well, that will, of course, inflame people's sense of inequality, especially given America's like undeniably racist heritage. Uh, understandably um, so, that people would be like, what the hell, yeah. you know, why? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Understandably so, that people would be um, upset because, I mean, our criminal system is, I mean, it is racist. Like, that's mm -hmm. just, it's just, a, that's a fact. Um, and it should upset people. But then the response in, in America is one of, well, we need to, we need to level up punishment. So we need to take this white defendant who is receiving this lenient sentence and we need to punish him more harshly as opposed to leveling down punishment, as opposed to saying, well, you know, let's reevaluate the punishments that we're like giving these um, these other defendants, and let's say we need to like sort of give them less time, or like pass laws allowing us to resentence people, or give second looks. Like that's not the American impulse. The American mm -hmm. impulse is we need to level up, and that doesn't have to be the case. And like that hasn't been the case in other countries, like you know Germany and France. Um, you know this article, two cultures of punishment. It really does a masterful job of comparing and contrasting the um the impulses in america and europe uh like they're just as we have in america like competitions between politicians as to who can um want to punish criminals the most like mm -hmm. uh i forget who said it but there's this wonderful saying that every politician wants to uh punish criminals just a little bit more than the last person who spoke <laughs> yeah. uh and, and but in Europe, it's there. There are examples of it being the reverse. That like every politician wants to be more lenient and more humane to prisoners than than the last person, uh, than the last politician who spoke. And that um, juxtaposition really kind of, I, I don't know, to my American ears, it sort of blew my mind. That like right. there, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, but that is the American, the American view is that we need to treat everyone equally harshly, not. We need to be more lenient across the board. It's like um, our default. Our default. So you're saying like our default position is, is as so like the population they see the, the the discrepancy in the way two people are treated, and they see the like the the, the wealthier white kid, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, well, he got X treatment, and what it was was that for even even if it was based on prejudice and discrimination and racism it was it was the system rec saying okay well we believe that this person can be reformed and there are avenues to you know help them reintegrate into society and there's the, the, this type of an, of an approach and then you have the the other person who they 
they don't extend that courtesy to. So mm-hmm. rather than saying, rather than fixing the problem by saying, let's let's show that same compassion to the young black man, it's well, let's punish the white kid like we punish the yeah. the, the person we're discriminating. Against. Can you can you talk because I, I think there's a you you provide an excellent example, something I think everyone would be familiar with. Can you mm-hmm. can you just talk about the Turner example, the, the yeah. that case, uh, if you could? Yeah, I mean, uh, so in the paper, I mean, I use the, you know, Brock Turner case, um, People versus Brock Turner, which um, people may be familiar with his name as the, um, you know, the Stanford rapist, or, you know, uh, even though he wasn't, you know, technically convicted of, of rape, but um, he, uh, so the facts leading up to, you um, you know, his, uh, his case and his conviction and this whole cultural, I mean, it really sort of became a flashpoint in, in the Me Too movement. Um, but um, Turner assaulted um, Chanel Miller, who um, she was for a long time just known as um, Emily Doe. Uh, but then she subsequently, you know, she wrote a book, um, which I think is, um, you know, I thought was quite good. Uh, but uh, at, a, at a Stanford at a Stanford party. Uh, he sexually assaulted her, um, and he was, you know, very quickly apprehended. Um, and he elected to go to trial and, uh, he was convicted and he was given a, um, you know, a relatively short custodial sentence, like six months in jail. Um, but then, um, you know, lifetime on the sex offense registry, uh, felony conviction, um, and the reason why t- uh, this case kind of became a national flashpoint um, had to do with the sentence that Turner received. That um, well, one, the sentence that Turner received, also the um, impact statement that um, that Miss Miller wrote and um, you know read into the record, which was picked up by I believe BuzzFeed News initially, and it's a really powerful statement about. Um, you know, um, about her experiences as, you know, having survived this thing, uh, this, this assault, this crime. Um, and it was, you know, very eloquent, I think spoke to a lot of people's, um, experiences, like a lot of people who are survivors of sexual violence, like myself included, um, really resonated with a lot of what she had to say. Um, but also the, um, the sentence that Turner received was another reason why this became kind of a, um, you know, a household name was that the perception was that he received an extremely lenient sentence. Um, and that perception was fanned by um, a pretty, you know, sophisticated uh, advocacy. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, there was a lot of advocacy that was sort of spearheaded by Stanford law professor Michelle Dauber uh, to essentially get judge the, the judge in the case, Aaron Persky, recalled from the bench. Um, that relied on a narrative of Persky's record that was, you know, simply not true. Um, and, but that was sort of the media narrative. And that's, uh, and it became a sort of recall, this, this notion of recalling Aaron Persky from the bench um, became a, um, I mean, it became a, a sort of a referendum on, on sexual violence in America. Um, and he was ultimately recalled from the bench. Um, by, I forget what the, what the, it's in the paper, but I forget what the vote margin was. Um, but he was recalled from the bench and, um, and yeah, I mean, the paper talks about that, but then also like the, you know, like what are the consequences of doing that? Like if, you know, Persky, he was a judge who was regarded by, I mean, um, both prosecutor and the defense and the defense bar, um, in Palo Alto as being um, fair-minded, uh, you know, a good, he was regarded as being a good judge, you know, prior to this, prior to this case. And so if you recall, but the notion of like recalling judges for not being harsh enough. For being too uh, compassionate, basically, and yeah. trying to or, or, But I mean, in Persky's case, it, it wasn't even that he was being too compassionate. Like he followed the recommendation, like he, right. he followed the guidelines that were given to him in the law. Um, and he also followed the recommendations that were given by um, the probation department, like in, in criminal case, in state criminal cases and in federal criminal cases, a standard practice is after someone was convicted of a crime, but prior to sentencing, 
um, they'll go through a an interview process with um, you know a probation officer, and that officer's job is to like you know collect all of the relevant information about their background, um, as well as the circumstances of the offense, um, as well as getting input from the victim, um, and they their job is to recommend to the judge what an appropriate sentence would be, and that was you know the recommendation. Um, And um, so it wasn't even, in Percy's case, it wasn't even that he was, like, he didn't, he just followed the recommendation. Um, But, uh, you know, I mean, Brock Turner, uh, who, you know, I mean, he committed, I mean, he committed, he committed a terrible crime. Um, And the fact that he was also, like, it fed into this, um, I mean, the reality of our criminal system is that it is racist. I mean, it is, there is inequality. Mm-hmm. And so it fed, it tapped right into that sort of swollen nerve and it became this, um, you know, very appealing target for uh, people to be able to, um, you know, express how seriously they want to take the problem of sexual violence in America. Um, and use this case as kind of a vehicle, even if that um, the vehicle, the way in which it was done, was not exactly didn't line up with um, reality in a number of in a number of respects. Um, but yeah, so that's I mean the and um, and yeah, and as I mentioned in the aftermath of the Turner case, um, Chanel Miller wrote a book. Um, uh, Say my name, I think, is the title um, of the of the book. Um, and, you know, Turner, I don't, not really sure what, um, I know he's, I think last I checked, I think he's living in Ohio. I mean, he's on Ohio's registry, um, listed as a level three, uh, sex offender, which, um, I can get, you know, all that mean, it doesn't really mean levels and tiers on registries don't really mean much in terms of predicting someone's dangerousness. Um, and uh, yeah, so he'll be on there for you know for life. Um, and how many? How, can you talk about the scale of that? Like, so he so he's been yeah. added to this this registry. Like mm. how big? So I think people just so people can get their head around this, it's not just. So when you you commit a sex offense, it's not just mm. that you're you you go to prison or you get probation. Um, there's yeah. there are these reg. Can you talk about the scale of the, those and then maybe some of the implications of of these? Yeah. So, um, you know, registries, you know, really just kind of started out. Um, I mean, there's actually a pretty long American history of registries. They were originally um, deployed to target gay men in California. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, they continue to have disparate impacts on um, LBGTQ populations. But so uh, they were originally just basically supposed to be these lists. Right. Of people who had been convicted of a sex offense. He put them on a list. Um, But over time, they grew. I mean, and the modern registries really started in the early 90s. And they're originally supposed to be uh, just for law enforcement eyes only. Um, But then they became um, public with, um, you know, what's sort of colloquially and legally in New Jersey known as Megan's Law. and they became so they became these public lists of individuals who, with past convictions for sex offenses. And the idea behind it was that what people believed was that anyone who's been convicted of a sex offense, well, they're obviously going to go and commit another sex offense. Like, and so if we just know where these people are, then we will be able to protect ourselves, protect our families, um, etc. Of course, that's not like the um, you know that's not what the data on sexual violence supports at all. Um, but they didn't really become the modern form until a pair of United States Supreme Court cases in 2003. Um, and just briefly, what those cases did was uh, the first case, um, Smith versus Stowe, was a question about whether Alaska's um, sex offense registry um, was punishment, was punitive, um, or whether it was the civil regulation. And that question is important for constitutional reasons, um, because there's a provision of the Constitution that it says that you can't increase someone's punishment 
after they've already served, you know, been held accountable, served their time, left the system. You can't go back and say, ah, actually, we want to sentence you to another year in prison because we think what you did was actually worse, really bad. So we want to give you more punishment. Can't do that. It's, um, you know, no ex post facto punishments is part of our Constitution. Um, and the United States Supreme Court, so if they would have said it's punishment, then you can't say if someone was convicted of a sex offense in 19, the 1970s, 80s, whatever, you can't then come back in, you know, 94, 2000, whenever, and put them on this registry if it's punishment. And the United States Supreme Court said, well, because of the, um, you know, frightening and high rate of reoffense, uh, which was their, you know, their language, um, they, they, they essentially found it wasn't punishment, um, due in part to this perception that there's this, they're always going to reoffend. Um, so it essentially denied important constitutional protections to a really unpopular group of people. And then the second case was called Connecticut Department of Public Safety um, versus Doe. And the question in that case was the, the Doe was a, uh, someone who'd been convicted of a sex offense in Maryland, uh, I think it was Maryland, wanted to put him on the registry. And he said, wait, wait, before you put me on this registry, you have to give me a hearing. You have to let due process requires that you give me an opportunity to demonstrate that I'm not dangerous, you know, so, mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court said, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to give anyone a hearing. You can just, if the legislature says you've committed this crime or putting you on this list, then, you know, you don't need it. You don't need a hearing or anything like that. So essentially what these two cases did was they took this question of dangerousness and they made it both one irrefutable like it doesn't, you know, you're presumed to be dangerous. And even if you can demonstrate that um, you're not, then, but it just doesn't matter. But so they made it irrefutable and also totally irrelevant. Like the question of whether or not you go onto a registry has nothing to do with whether or not you present any kind of a public safety um, risk, even though that is, of course, the official rationale for, for these registries. So in the wake of those cases, um, state legislatures kind of took that as a green light to add more and more restrictions, regulations. I mean, it's really kind of been death by a thousand cuts. Uh, so like every legislative session, state legislatures will add new regulation, you know, new restrictions, new laws, new crimes that apply just to people who are on registries. And to give people a sense of the scope of these things now, they... Um, I mean, so when we talk about the registry, really what we're talking about, every state has their own registry mm -hmm. with their own rules, their own um, laws and their own. Um, so there's like, you know, 50 plus registries um, in the United States because every state has their own. Um, and, you know, it's actually hard to get a sense of how many people are on them. Uh, at last count, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 2019 released a count of, I think it was like 964,000 people or something like that. Wow. But they stopped count, for whatever reason, they've stopped keeping track of it. Like there's, to my knowledge, there's no organization or agency that's actually keeping track of how many people are on registries. And um, they've, in fact, become sort of so... Uh, you know, they've become indistinguishable from, I guess, what you call open air prisons um, in that, you know, your movement is pretty tightly regulated. Uh, if you're constantly at risk of rearrest and reconviction for, um, you know, failure to comply offenses, which in the context of like to analogize it to if you analogize being on the registry to parole, which actually some courts have started doing. Um, then uh, basically the most common reason for people on registries to go back to prison is not committing a new sex offense. It's committing one of the, uh, like a technical violation, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the rules for information that you have to report, uh, when you have to report it, areas that you can't be, um, you know, near like, um, you know, banishment zones, housing banishment zones, uh, 
they can be so complicated and vague and technical that it, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard for lawyers and judges to figure out what they mean, let alone people who may be struggling with right. um, just trying to survive. So, um, yeah, they are, they've essentially morphed into these uh, law professor, Catherine Carpenter, calls them um, like super registration schemes. And that's kind of what they've become. They've really become a, a new generation of carceral control. Um, with the idea being that, well, we need to, this will help us um, with the sexual violence problem in America. And, you know, I think that what the, a fair assessment of what the data reflects um, on that question is that they, um, that they don't seem to be doing much of anything. And for all the, it's, it, except, I mean, uh, they do a really good job of continuing to punish people who have already been held accountable for some crime. Um, and their families, because, um, you know, if someone's on the registry, then uh, it's not just them who's, you know, who's, who's on, it's everyone at that household right. um, who has to also sort of bear the, uh, the consequences of whatever, um, you know, whatever state that state's registry laws are um, imposed on them. Do you, are you so, seeing, are you seeing like a technological so are you seeing technology, these new, new technologies and tracking technologies making their way into this apparatus as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really sort of the next, the next step. I mean, you, you know, new technologies uh, and then also private equity. I mean, there are private firms that are, uh, I mean, if you, you can, we can kind of analogize it to the prison system and uh, where we have private prisons who operate within the prison system. Well, we have the same thing that's happening with um, registries. You're having private entities contract with states to essentially um, privatize the running of, of the registry. Uh, and so I think that that and also new technologies means that, um, you know, I mean, I think that this is an important arm of the carceral state that... Um, that, I mean, is pretty enormous. Uh, I mean, like I said, it's about a million people. So think of, you know, we have like a little over 2 million people in prison in this country. And of course, we all know about prisons and we all know about how they work, but we don't really know or talk about, um, you know, registries very much. They're sort of, I mean, they've been getting more attention lately, but um, it's the, the amount of um, attention given to them is relatively muted compared to the number of people who are impacted by them. Because it's, again, it's not just person themselves, but then it's also like their whole family. So, I mean, it's millions and millions of people right. um, who are kind of directly impacted by these things. And if you're, so this is, a, this is not an optimistic question, but so if, if, I'm a, if politicians in the United States benefit from passing harsher laws to, 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 to control people in this way yeah. and there is um, private equity which has a profit to be made and you also have um, now you have like the tech tech industry who can get a piece of the the apple it mm -hmm. seem it seems like the only thing that would hold this back is an enlightened population who puts justice in the forefront and makes rational decisions and uses science and tries to figure out, you know, what's the best way to solve this social problem. Right. Uh, so you kind of get where I'm going. Uh, what, what are, what are you, what's your prognosis for the future? I mean, do you see this ballooning and continuing to grow or? I, I mean, my, pro if I, you know, if I could tell the future in five minutes in advance, <laughs> I'd be making my living at the horse track. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I think, I don't know, like, I don't want to sound too, I mean, it's, it would be really easy to just, for me to just be very cynical here, but uh, I, I do think that actually people um, under underneath all of the, like, I think that there's a lot of emotion here. You know, I think there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of fear. Um, and I think that underneath all of that, like, people really do have a sense of wanting to fix this problem, figure out what we can do to not only hold people accountable um, for harm that they've caused someone else, but that what we can do to actually prevent that harm from happening in the first place. Like I, I believe that impulse is there in people and in politicians too. Um, and I think that the task is really in bringing people around to, you know, showing them that, I mean, what the, 
what the science says and you know, what people's personal experiences are is that the way that we're doing things now, not, not only does it um, not help us meet those goals, but it actually gets in the way. It right. actually makes right. things harder to, to, to do. Um, and, and I've had some, you know, I mean, I think I've had success in having those conversations with people. Um, you know, but I also, you know, I mean, the cynical answer is, um, uh, you know, like, well, in the paper, the end of the paper, uh, I, I, I decided to end it not with like with sort of setting out. Yeah, yeah I, I, I said it, I ended it with a question as opposed to like, uh, you know, here's where we go from here. Because, I mean, I'm, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But but I but the problem that I see is that I don't think that we have really like I think that there's multiple paths that we can take as a culture um, in dealing with punishment and sexual violence and sexual harm and it depends on what we want. Um, like I just said, I think I think a lot of people do want this you know want this sense of accountability and and want to prevent harm from happening. Um, but I think that there's another impulse that's perhaps equally strong, maybe stronger, um, at least in America, that we don't we don't really care about preventing harm or, mm -hmm. or preventing crime. Like this whole note and, and not just with sexual violence, like rape and, and molestation, and sexual assault, not just with that, but crime writ large. Like we don't really care about preventing crime. We just want we just want to punish people, and um, and if we prevented crime, then there would be no one to punish, and that is I think intolerable. To where do you, where do you think this comes? Where do you think this? Uh, I'm asking you to pontificate here. What where do you think this comes from? Where where does this? Because it does seem like a, a a very distinct not distinctly but it's an exaggerated impulse in the American psyche. I I would argue. Where do you think? What do you think the origins of this are? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it, that's probably above my pay grade, but I do know that there's another paper I read that was really influential. Um, and I, I cited in the paper, um, uh, I'm blanking on the author's names. Um, I think Enrique Carvalho and um, Anastasia Chamberlain. I, I think those are their names. But anyway, the paper is called Why Punishment Pleases. And it, the paper um, talks about, uh, well, why punishment pleases. And, and the, the basic thesis is that punishment um, is a sort of glue that holds, that gives us a sense of social solidarity, you know, that like we are the, you know, we are the good guys, they are the bad guys, and punishment kind of gives us a sense of purpose and belonging um, and that everything is sort of going right with society, especially in uncertain times of increased, you know, societal um, turmoil, you know, like we're in now. Um, and that it gives us a sense of purpose and belonging, like in this in-group solidarity, because we've identified this out-group of criminals and um, lawbreakers. But of course, the, the reality is that we're all, like everyone's a criminal, um, because everyone's broken the law at some point in their lives. Um, whether or not they've got caught for it is a whole nother, you know, is a whole nother matter entirely. But, um, but that paper was really influential, um, you know, in my thinking and especially about this question as well, because I think that that impulse, that punitive impulse is especially, um, present when we talk about, um, sexual harm and sexual violence. I mean, there's this exceptionalism that even, now, as we're talking about, you know, like police abolition in the wake of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, um, you know, police unions and, and sheriff's departments are pivoting to, well, you know, what about the sex offenders? Um, you know, what about the rapists? Like, that's sort of like the, the last line of defense. I mean, even amongst folks on the left, um, it's like as soon as you um, bring out, uh, you know, the, the sex offender, um, it's like all of a sudden any appetite for uh, not even just abolition, but reform um, becomes, I mean, becomes dimmed because of all these sort of cultural um, tropes and myths about how sexual violence happens, who perpetrates it, 
um, and what we need to do about it. Um, so, you know, as, yeah, as far as where it comes from, um, you know, I'm not, I mean, I'm I think sure. <laughs> I, I would, I would definitely recommend, you know, folks, um, that, that paper, um, again, I, it's in one of the, it's in one of the footnotes towards the end of the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really, I mean, it's a really enlightening read. And I mean, I think it really speaks to, yeah, this notion that like we, um, you know, as a society, it's like punishment has become something like a drug. And so going back to what I was saying about, you know, I end the paper with a question. The question is, what do we want? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because if we want to prevent sexual harm or we want to like incentivize accountability um, and, and that's like the other thing is that because like the, the consequences are so high for a defendant, like and I also, you know, um, got to witness this, you know, in, you know working in criminal defense um, in cases where our client was charged with some sort of a sex offense, because the consequences are so high for the defendant. Like there's no incentive for them to say I, to take responsibility, even if, if they are guilty. The only incentive, because of you know, it's right. essentially civil death sentence, right, um, is to fight like hell. And, mm-hmm. and generally speaking, in cases of sexual violence, the only way to fight like hell is to attack the credibility of the victim, uh, which of course, in turn, for then victims, makes this whole process of going through the legal system. Uh, I mean, more traumatizing. Why would, I, why would I report it if I know that I'm going to be? Yeah, I'm if be I know that I'm going to like have my credibility attacked by some defense attorney, um, or be you know have my and that's the other thing that I talk a lot about in the paper is that police are actually not generally very good mm-hmm. at uh, solving cases of sexual violence, like rape um, and sexual assault, and they generally tend or at least have tended to treat victims um, as sort of hostile and oftentimes charging them with false reports, even when late, you know, then would later come out that they were actually like, they were actually um, victims. And I, and I don't think that's necessarily because like, you just have like these evil police officers who hate, like, I don't think that's the reality. I think there's a lot of structural and systemic and cultural reasons for why police are so bad uh, at, handling um these sorts of cases um but i mean that's another part of it too so yeah like if you're like if you've been assaulted or raped and then you your option is we can report to the police or you don't and if you report to the police well then they're going to treat you as 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 a hostile Mm -hmm. you know they're going to treat you with hostility uh skepticism Um, then you're going to get to go through this um, legal gauntlet where your credibility is going to be put under a microscope, you're going to get cross-examined, it's going to be this long, drawn-out, painful process. Um, And then if you, you know, if you win, it's like, what do you get exactly? Like you get it, you get, they go to prison where they're going to be, you know, subject to more trauma and then probably come out of this whole process like worse, like in worse shape, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, I mean, maybe some people like want that. But I think the sense that I have, at least in talking to like other survivors of sexual violence and in, in doing this work is that I think what a lot of people want, I mean, not only account that notion of accountability and uh, ownership but also like a commitment to change. Like they don't want that person to hurt anyone else again. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I think we know how we can help sort of bring those changes about, but our system doesn't really, it isn't really set up for that. Like it's not really built for that. That's why I say like it produces bad outcomes for everyone involved. Um, and so, yeah, if that's really your only option as a victim, it's like, well, no wonder a lot of people don't report. Especially yeah, I, I, because... I wouldn't. I don't think I would. I don't think I would want to go through that. Yeah. I mean, especially because, um, I mean, most people who, um, most people who commit acts, like, that's the other thing about, that's the reason why, um, you know, why I think there's a good argument that registries perpetuate sexual violence, because they center in the public's imagination um, uh, places where sexual violence is most likely to occur as safe. Like, um, homes, you know, um, 
like sexual violence is perpetrated by people in our lives, like mm -hmm. people we know, people we trust, uh, people sometimes we love. Um, and it's generally not going to be the stranger down the street who is lurking in bushes. Like those cases, I mean, those cases are exceedingly rare. And of course, when they happen, they become, you know, these media, Huge. these media flashpoints. But that's not the, the reality for, you know, most sexual violence. But, you know, this whole model that we have of the stranger predator monster that we just need to contain, well, um, that's because it's so out of step with reality like if you can't like if we can't understand the reality of sexual harm how do we hope to be able to sort of craft policy and law that's going to you know help us fix the problem uh, in the first place? Address it. so it sounds like you're you're saying that we have a gatekeeper problem you call the police the gatekeepers yeah. that they, we do a poor job of of managing this gate we have this adversarial system we have mm -hmm. this carceral state that that punishes people in a way that you're arguing perpetuates the problem and makes things worse and that the, the that what we need to do is step back and then ask ourselves you know what is it that we're trying to accomplish that's your yeah. that's your advice yeah i mean i think i, I mean i don't know if it's advice so much it's just like <laughs> just my observation but um yeah like i don't think like registries, like my experience with registries is that they certainly don't help, don't help anyone to become better people. Like right. they don't help people to change. Like the things that, you know, criminological research tells us that is associated with people like staying out of prison is like having stable housing, having ties in the community, right. having a job, like having a purpose to get out of bed mm -hmm. in the morning. Those are all things that like help people like stay on the straight and narrow. And the thing is like, what registries do is they sever, they, they attack all of those right. connections. So they're and designed, so, they're designed to attack the things that would moor someone and keep and keep yeah, them. All right. Exactly. I mean, I think that, you know, honestly, like reoffense is incentivized by these. And that's actually what the research has shown. I mean, that's what research, the empirical research has demonstrated is that uh, registries are actually associated with an increase in reoffending um, because it essentially makes, um, it destabilizes someone's life so much that, um, you know, presumably the, the, um, the costs of committing another crime are seen as not, you know, not that bad compared to the alternative of trying to sort of live life as a uh, as a leper in society. And that's not to say that like people, like the, the the other thing I should make sort of clear for people who may not be familiar with registries is that I think that accountability is really important for people who have committed any kind of harm. Um, and the system that we have, imperfect as it is, and it is there are many things that you could say about how imperfect it is. Um, but, you know, people receive a sentence and they serve that sentence. And then when they're done with that sentence, they're supposed to be, you know, back in society and, uh, they've been held accountable and, you know, we should all want that person to succeed because to the extent that that person who's coming out of prison, to the extent that they succeed, like that means we all succeed. Right. Everyone in the communities is, is, is succeeding if they're doing well. And that's what we want. That's what we should want. Registries don't come into the picture until that moment, until that moment when they're coming out of prison. It's this whole other layer of um, punishment that's kind of like put on top of them at that point. Um, so this isn't when I say that, like, um, you know, like registries are like uh, bad or inhumane or unjust or anything like that. Like it's not talking about because sometimes people commit really horrific acts and cause a tremendous amount of harm to people. And I don't mean to minimize that at all. Um, but that's why we have this sort of like front end of the system. So they may have served a long time in prison. Um, and that may have been the right thing in that case. Right. But the fact is like that prison term ends mm -hmm. and they're going to come out and we want them to succeed. And so again, the things that we know are associated with being with succeeding are things that the registry um, and all the associated rules with registries um, undermine. And so we should ask, why are we, you know, why are we doing that? Why, why are we, we doing a failure? We did, and I've seen this across a variety. It's not just the sex offense, but like you see this in like the war on drugs, you see these counter, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I think, and I think it is this, 
impulse to punish. And I and I, I thought it was interesting that you, you talk about that impulse presenting itself in this fallout from the George Floyd murder, where we have, you know, you're, you're saying people are saying, what about this? The police saying, what about the sex offenders? That's an example. And then uh, I know this might not be a popular thing to say right now, but I've seen also, especially from my friends on the left, mm-hmm. an impulse to boil everything down to individual culpability and mm-hmm. to want to punish. So yeah. like, like, well, uh, pick punish, punishing officers when we, when we know that. So like my, my example would be the, the Rayshard Brooks case in, 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 uh, Atlanta, um, which I see as a systemic problem with training and fear and procedures that created mm-hmm. a situation where this officer killed somebody. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's much easier for us to say punish this person yeah. than it Absolutely. is to do the hard work of reform. Absolutely. I mean, there's a great paper uh, that I think that you would probably enjoy. And I'm not sure if I cite it or not, um, but it was by a um, law professor at um, UC Hastings, uh, Hadara Viram, about um, progressive punitivism, where one of the things that she talks about is this notion that like we like, I mean, people on the left are, um, I think, understandably, you know, I mean, I've worked on police shooting cases before on the on the plaintiff side where, um, you know, suing the suing the police for uh, under Section 1983 for unlawful use of force. Like I and I think that there are there is a tremendous amount of justified outrage, um, you know, about police misconduct and police violence and a total lack of transparency and accountability. Um, and you're right. Like the, the notion is that we want to pick up. Uh, the hammer and we just want to hit that person as hard as we can with it Um, because that's kind of like the culture that we're in you know that we we see this in terms of uh, individual culpability not in terms of systemic forces you know like um, training or uh, collective bargaining agreements qualified immunity like those are all things that like um, you know if we can if we can tweak those then it's going to produce more just and fair um, outcomes across the board um, and, and also, I mean, I think it's, it's difficult to not want punishment, too, because I think a lot of these cases are so egregious um, and they, they are outrageous and they should be out. Um, you know, people should be upset about them. But then the, the you know, where I think you and I would, would probably agree that there needs to be more consideration or thought put into, well, what do we do with that outrage? Like we can, if we give this, you know, police officer a life sentence in prison, like does that, is that justice? Like, does that mean um, that we've fixed these, these sort of systemic problems? Right. Um, or is that just like sort of sating our, well, I mean, the, the term that Professor Vera um you know, coin is that just saving our sort of progressive punitivism? Because it's not also not just police, but then it's also me too. It's also you look at corporate malfeasance, uh, white collar crime. Um, you know, like a staple of Elizabeth Warren's campaign, presidential campaign was we're going to lock up, um, you know, lock up the bankers. And like, and again, like the outrage is justified. Like, I mean, I think if you look at total lack of accountability with corporate malfeasance and um, that sort of thing, like. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's un- and, and the fact that you know, we've had these financial meltdowns um, that were due in large part to just total greed. Yeah, of course people are upset, people are angry, people want you know heads to roll. But is doing that going to fix you know right. any of the problems other than just um, kind of sating this this impulse? So, yeah, yeah, I think that drug really- that you, the drug that you talk about it's like a shot of the shot of that drug that we we yeah, seem to be addicted I, to. I think- and then, it, you know, the pendulum like swings both ways, you know, I mean, I think, uh, and so, uh, you know, I think, and I am hopeful for this like movement that's really gained a lot of, a lot of steam, um, in response to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and Rayshard Brooks, uh, about, you know, police abolition, like this notion that, um, you know, we need to envision different methods, different means of community safety, um, and so I think that we're in a moment in time where a lot of things are possible. So it's kind of uh, things that seem possible now um, certainly didn't seem that way, no. you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, so it'll be interesting. I mean, it'll be, 
I don't know, interesting is maybe the wrong, like there's an old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, curse to live in interesting, yeah, I've heard that one. <laughs> we're living in interesting times, It'll, but it'll be, um, you know, I, I think it's, there's certainly a possibility um, that we could have a radic- we could radically reimagine how we want to approach questions of punishment and justice and accountability and what f- you know what what fairness looks like and how we can involve um, communities and how we can you know transform not only those communities but also um, people who have been harmed and also people who cause it as well. Um, but it'll of course remain to be seen if that's or if we just continue to um, go with what's you know kind of what's familiar, which is um, we have a long uh, history in America of just, you know, talking about these things with a language of individual, cult, like you said, individual culpability, evil, punishment, cages, like that's kind of the language we're very familiar with, we're very comfortable with, um, and it'll remain to be seen if we're able to, you know, pivot out of that. So... I've taken up a ton of your, a ton of your time. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you go, but uh, I wanted to t- uh, let me turn it over to you one more time. You, you're saying that um, we do live in this. It, it seems like it, uh, I can't think of another moment in uh, in my lifetime where uh, I was so uncertain about what was going to happen next. Sort of what road we were going to go down as a society. So this mm-hmm. seems like a moment of possibility. Can you just leave us on with two things? Um, your final thoughts for that for this moment and then also how people uh, could reach out to you uh, or engage with your work yeah um so you know again i think it's a hopeful moment i mean i think that um one thing i'll say is that um as ter- you know as terrible as 2020 has been um and as as tragic and you know um quite frankly horrific as the events, um, you know, the, the murder of Breonna Taylor and, and George Floyd and, and others um, have been, what uh, gives it gives me hope to see the response that people have had to that, that people have gone out in the streets, um, that people have uh, really elevated this issue of, I mean, um, you know, one of the things that I don't think we've ever really reckoned with in America is the fact that we're a nation that was founded on slavery and genocide and racism. And we've never, we've never really squarely confronted that. And I no, think no maybe truth that, and reconciliation commissions yeah. in the United States. <laughs> no, no, we, we haven't had any of that. And I mean, in fact, I mean, we just continue kicking the can down the road. And I think that we're at a moment in our culture where like, maybe we really can finally start to reckon with our national original sin. And I mean, I think a lot of our national problems like go back to that so i mean it's really it has actually been really heartening to see like so much passion and energy um from quite frankly i mean not just people in america but i mean there have been worldwide protests Mm -hmm. about this so i do think that we exist in a moment where um yeah like like i was saying like things that didn't seem possible even a few weeks ago are you know possible now um and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful and, and I'll continue to be hopeful that, um, you know, that, that we'll continue to think, you know, think big uh, in terms of where we want to go uh, as a society and what we want to see happen um, in our communities. Uh, and and it, I have hope that, you know, perhaps just the punitive impulses won't, won't win out. But again, you know, remain, remains to be seen. Uh, my, my opinion and three dollars will get you a nice cup of coffee <laughs> at Starbucks. Um, and uh, yeah, if people want to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter um, at um, it's G underscore P A D R A I C. Uh, and also, I have a website where people can read my uh, writing on, you know, I generally write about, um, you know, sexual violence, registries, civil rights, that sort of thing. I've also uh, have a whole nother. Um, a plank of my work on voting rights uh, and you know civic engagement and all that's on my on my website, which is just uh, guyhamiltonsmith.com, and it's also linked on my Twitter um, bio and people can reach out. Um, my D, my uh, DMs, my direct messages are open on Twitter, so anyone can shoot me a message, um, and you can also drop me a line through my website too.
So. Cool. If I, uh, take a look in the description below, everybody. I put uh, uh, his his Twitter, put his website. I also put a link. I put a the the uh, the article that we discussed today. And if you uh, shoot me an email with any of the other articles you mentioned, you want me to add in the description. I want to thank you for taking the time. And maybe th this is a, a transition period. Maybe in a year or so, you can come back and we can talk about what's happened. Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank All you right. so. Thank you so much.